On the afternoon of September 2nd of 2008, 40-year-old Deputy Ann Jackson and her partner Terry Eskew responded to a 911 call placed by a rather upset Chester Rose that his neighbor, Isaac Zamora, had broken into his house, rummaged through his stuff, and simply left. As the patrol car heads towards Chester's house, Ann receives a call directly from the suspect's mom, Denise Zamora, who told Ann that Isaac was behaving badly again. Ann said that she heard and decided to head over to Denise's house instead, just in case Isaac decides to come home. Isaac Zamora is a 28-year-old house painter that struggled with mental health issues, which caused them to be on the wrong side of people's good graces countless times. And in a small town like Algier, Washington, whose population barely broke into the hundreds in recent memory. When you're a known thief and drug addict, you definitely are the pariah that doesn't garner much sympathy. Except from someone like Deputy Ann Jackson, who actually had a soft spot for Isaac because her own brother suffered from a similar affliction and she understood firsthand how heartbreaking it could be for a family. She would go out of her way to be there for the Zamoras when they needed her, so much so that when Isaac was at his lowest points dealing with depression, he would ask his mom to call Anne to see if she had time to come over and talk. Anne's presence had a calming effect on him and he trusted her. He allowed himself to be vulnerable around her and she got to see a side of him that not many in the town ever did. The good side, just another imperfect human doing stupid yet harmless things like breaking into Chester's house and stealing nothing. So when Anne and her partner arrived at the Zamora residence that day, it truly wasn't anything new. Denise told them that Isaac wasn't home yet, so Anne told her partner to stay with Denise just in case he showed up, and she herself would head over just a few houses down to talk to Chester to see if he wanted to file a complaint against the neighborhood nuisance. As she set foot on Chester's property, she was surprised to see that Isaac was still there, but at least that would save her the wild goose chase. But before she could raise her hand to greet him, Isaac would raise a rifle and shoot the only person in town that genuinely tried to be his friend. He shoots her several more times to make sure she was dead. Something had snapped in Isaac's brain that day, and for the next two and a half hours, Isaac's Zamora would bring hell to his sleepy little town. My name is Killian, and welcome to True Crime Stories. As a kid, Isaac Zamora was described as a polite and happy child, well-behaved and well-liked by everyone. But at around age 14, something changed. He became more quiet and awkward, even around those closest to him. That same year in 1994, the family's house mysteriously burnt to the ground. But there's never been a solid connection to Isaac's growing reclusion and that fire. So as he rounded out his teen years, his introversion only got worse to the point where he was laughing and having conversations with himself even when others were present. He would be confrontational and extremely difficult to be around. But like most loving families, they always clung to the hope that their loving little Isaac that they lost long ago would reappear again. And at times, he would, and everything was great. But good Isaac would grow few and far between as he entered his 20s. Like most stories, when drugs enter the picture, things tend to go bad quickly. It led to numerous run-ins with the law for theft and possession. He also, strangely, starts living in the woods near his parents' house for days at a time, likely having conversations with himself about Lord knows what, getting lost in an ever unhinging mind, festering with some unfounded anger, the most disturbing thing to come of it. He started hearing the voice of God, but it had the underlying tones of the devil. By early 2008, he was thrown in prison for yet another drug charge, this time 
he was labeled a high-risk offender and slapped with six months in prison. During his incarceration, psychiatrists diagnosed that he had mental issues but classified him as nonviolent, which oddly was in contrast to his prior records which would log the same mental problems but issued a warning that he had the potential to become dangerous. One clear giveaway that you're dealing with a highly unstable man is simply look at what his mother does. Denise Zamora wrote to the authorities when it was nearing her son's release date to keep him locked up because it was clear to her that he was not any better, arguably worse. Unfortunately, the letter made little impact. The state prescribed Isaac some medication and released him with no set follow-up or supervision. Just three days after her son had come home, Denise again was on the phone with 911 after Isaac got into an altercation with his father and brother threatening to kill them all. Isaac was arrested and placed in a cell to cool off because as the saying goes, cooler heads will prevail. But I do believe that only applies to heads that don't have voices. He was released the following morning. And surprise, surprise, shortly after that, Isaac is caught breaking into a couple's home where he confronts the wife and fortunately was restrained by the husband until the police arrive. They perform another quote unquote mental health assessment, which turns up nothing. And he is again released the following day, which would be the Tuesday of September 8th. 58-year-old Chester Rose was a divorcee who lived alone and lived life to the fullest. He was in the construction business, and on this day, he was enjoying the beautiful home he had built himself. So it was exceptionally annoying when someone decided to break into it. It was that troublesome Zamora boy sifting through his stuff like he wasn't even there. The old man picks up the phone and calls the police and takes it even one step further by calling Isaac's mother directly. Isaac Zamora found Chester's belongings to be a complete waste of time. He found nothing useful. He sees Chester Rose looking at him, obviously calling the police. Isaac gives him a cold glare and exits the house. But he didn't go very far. He simply walked next door and broke into that house as well. Here he took some prescription drugs and a large knife. From there, he broke into the house adjacent to that. Here, he finally found something useful. A handgun and a Winchester rifle. He grabbed as much ammo as he could pocket and left. Back to Chester's house. Isaac breaks in again and quickly finds Chester and shoots him multiple times. Chester Rose, a beloved figure in the community for over 20 years, dies immediately. He left behind two loving daughters. Isaac then looks out the window and sees his good friend, Deputy Ann Jackson. But he doesn't see Ann. By his own accounts, he saw a demon, an evil he had to slay in order to protect his loved ones. He goes outside and immediately takes aim at Ann. Alarmed, she instinctively pulls out her gun, but it was too late. She is shot multiple times as she returns fire, her bullets flying away aimlessly. Ann Jackson is killed on the spot. Her memorial service would be attended by almost 5,000 people, including state senators, colleagues, victims, families, firefighters, and a regiment of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Isaac Zamora, after being satisfied that Ann was dead, runs off into the neighborhood. 57-year-old David Ratcliffe was a successful contractor that constructed many of the homes in Skagit County. He was working on his latest construction with his employee, 38-year-old Greg Gillum. They were focused on their work and didn't hear the footsteps that entered their work site. Isaac shoots both men, but what he does next defies explanation. He takes a power saw and mutilates their faces and torsos. David Ratcliffe left behind a wife and two children. Greg Gillum had just moved to town from California 
he leaves behind his parents and six siblings, one of which being his twin brother. Isaac finds David's keys and now has himself a pickup truck, which he chaotically drives down a residential street. He rams the truck into the garage door of a house, which sends the owner, 56-year-old Fred Binchus, running outside to see what happened. The moment Isaac sees Fred, he shoots him, hitting Fred on the hip. The wounded man quickly turns and runs away. Isaac takes aim and hits him on the back. The adrenaline carries Fred behind his house and into the woods where he would finally collapse. Fred's wife, 48-year-old Julie Binchus, luckily was not home at the time. But life sometimes is a motherfucker because Julie pulls up the driveway at the exact wrong time. Just as she put the car in park, Isaac was at her window with a gun pointed at her head. Julie lets out a blood chilling scream. Fred Binchus from far off in the woods heard his wife, the love of his life for the past 26 years. Then he heard a gunshot and then silence. With everything Fred had in his being, he hobbled and crawled his way to a neighbor's house where he would be able to get help. He would survive the attack, but he lost Julie, who was his life. 61-year-old Richard Treston was just driving along when he was abruptly rammed by a truck. When both vehicles came to a stop, the driver of the truck jumps out and rushes to Richard's window. Richard recognizes the driver. It was Isaac. He had given the guy a ride numerous times when he needed it and felt they were buddies in a way. That was until Isaac aimed a rifle at him and said, It's your day to die and pulls the trigger. But the rifle jams. Still armed with the large knife, he stabs Richard two times in the chest and runs back to his truck and gasses it towards the Interstate 5 freeway. Richard Treston would survive this attack. Isaac pulls the truck into a shell gas station just before the freeway entrance. Ben Mercado pulls in on his motorcycle just behind the truck. Before Ben could pull up to the pump, a bullet tore into his arm and Ben's quick response was able to maneuver his bike, getting himself out of harm's way. He would survive the gunshot. Isaac, without another good shot at the motorcyclist, leaves the shell and enters the 5 freeway, heading south. He could now hear the police sirens getting closer. When he looked into his rear view, a few were already hot on his tail. He steps on the gas, taking the truck to over 90 miles per hour. He gains on the car of Charles and Jane Duncan. Charles, who was driving, sees a truck pull dangerously close. Before he could react, bullets were ripping through the driver's side window, shattering the glass. The truck then bolts away. Charles pulls over to make sure Jane was okay, and both were lucky to have literally dodged bullets, just shards of glass that were embedded in Charles's face. 64-year-old Leroy Lang would not be as fortunate. As he was driving to visit his mother in Mount Vernon, he didn't notice the truck speeding up to him like a bat out of hell, and before he could realize anything, a bullet struck him in his head, killing him instantly. His car would swerve and crash into the freeway median. He would leave behind a wife of 40 years and a son, which he had just visited. 42-year-old state trooper Troy Giddings gains on the speeding truck, positioning for the possibility of a pit maneuver. But before he could get anything aligned, Isaac was already taking shots at the patrol car. A bullet hits Troy in the arm and blood starts gushing. He knew it was bad. He had to abandon the chase and took the nearest exit, driving himself to the nearest hospital. Officer Giddings would survive the gunshot. And then, as abruptly as the chaos rained down on Skagit County over an 18 mile stretch, it ended just as abruptly. Isaac Zamora takes the downtown exit and drives straight towards the Skagit County Sheriff's Office where he would pull up to the front, get out of the truck put the rifle and handgun down on the ground and surrenders. As he is taken into custody, he starts muttering to himself. One officer says he hears Isaac ask, God, why did I do it? He is locked up with bail set at $5 million. 
When Isaac Zamora's trial is underway, his behavior in court was truly unpredictable and at times outright despicable. Sometimes he would refuse to enter the courtroom and had to be dragged in. Sometimes he would mutter loudly to himself, disrupting the proceedings, declaring that he was guilty in one breath and innocent in the next, belligerent and outright disrespectful about the people he killed right in front of their loved ones, making incoherent threats to them as well. He refused any further psychological tests and told the judge to just give him death, and then subsequently begging for his life. But this behavior wasn't being bought by detectives who believed that Zamora was faking the whole thing to garner more points towards an insanity plea. One detective says that he witnessed firsthand a calm and seemingly retrospective Zamora as they were transporting him from his cell to the courtroom. Once he was led in, it was almost like he flipped a switch and now was acting crazy. Once he was removed, he became normal and quiet again. Now if he was acting, he was able to fool two psychiatrists that ruled him incompetent to stand trial. He was sent by court order to the Western State Hospital, a leading forensic mental facility to receive treatment until they deemed him fit for trial. Prosecutors knew that Zamora and his lawyer was guaranteed to play the insanity card, which could possibly mean instead of rotting on death row, he would instead serve his time in a mental hospital. Their biggest fear was if or when the hospital deemed him recovered, he would be a free man. Now on the other hand, Zamora's lawyer had his own concerns and that was the insanity plea not working and his client receiving death. On November 2009, 14 months after the tragedy, prosecutors hammered out a plea deal that was accepted by Zamora's public defender. So the plea bargain read like this, Zamora was to plead insanity to the murder of Chester Rose and Ann Jackson, but would plead guilty to the four other murders and crimes. That would take the death penalty off the table, but stipulated that he would stay at the Western State Mental Hospital as long as it was deemed necessary. And if and when the hospital saw that Zamora was mentally fit to leave, he would then be transferred to the state prison to serve out four life sentences. Prosecutors knew that Isaac Zamora would probably continue acting crazy and finish out his life in the mental hospital, but it was a better alternative than seeing Zamora on the streets again. Now before you click away, I might have some good news for some of you. So for anyone that believes Isaac Zamora is just a bad person that faked insanity and deserves to serve his time at a real maximum security prison, well I guess I have a nice twist in this tale for you. Because just two years after that dark day, a new law was adopted in Washington. I think a few politicians felt just like you did. This law said that any state hospital that felt a patient was too dangerous for the facility to safely monitor, placing staff and other patients in jeopardy, that hospital had the right to transfer that person to a state prison, though technically still under the hospital's care. Now does that sound a little on the nose? For Isaac Zamora, he became the first mental patient to be removed from a mental hospital to a state penitentiary without any court approval. This did cause a lot of backlash from mental health advocates who says that it was punishing the mentally ill for their afflictions, which treads in an area I don't claim to have a strong opinion on. All I know is this. I consider myself a pretty compassionate person, but the moment you take a life, let alone six, I would cease to care what they do to you or where they put you. Crazy or not, you've proven that you could callously kill, you don't belong amongst the good people out here. Don't forget to thumbs up if you like how that ended, and don't forget to subscribe, trying to get new videos out every other week. My name is Killian, protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect.